Libros Schmibros is a podcast exploring the people, books, movies, and ideas that Angelinos care about in a thoughtful way that even New Yorkers can understand. We're coming to you from Libros Schmibros, our nonprofit bilingual lending library in Boyle Heights, on the west coast of the country and the east bank of the mighty Los Angeles River. Hello to John Friedman and to everybody who wants to eavesdrop on me talking with my old friend, John Friedman. Um, this is David Kippen with the Libro Schmibros podcast. Libro Schmibros, for those of you who don't know it yet, is a nonprofit bilingual storefront lending library in the historic 1889 Boyle Hotel. Are there any unhistoric 1889 hotels? I, I, I kind of doubt it. In Boyle Heights, just east of downtown Los Angeles and 3,000 miles west, I suspect, of Mr. Freeman, who is a literary polymath. Uh, first strayed into my ken when I was editing the San Francisco Chronicle book review and he was the hardest working man in the book business, freelancing, I don't know, five reviews a week and two interviews. Um, he has since gone on to edit Granta, to edit his eponymous quarterly Freemans, and I believe he's just ascended to an editorship of Knopf. We can talk about all that, um, but I especially want to talk about his new book, The Penguin Book, of the modern American short story. John, welcome to the Libros podcast. And what were you thinking editing anybody's book of the modern American short story? How did this idea germinate? Oh, it's so good to see you, David, and to talk to you. Uh, I remember very clearly that day when I met David going into the basement of the San Francisco Chronicle. In my head, the book editor should work in a kind of tower, you know, papered with illuminous you know, illuminated texts. And instead I had to work my way through the entrails of the newspaper to, until I found David and Oscar V. alone sort of camped in this book cave. Um, well, if they'd put us up in a tower, of course, our eyes would not have been strong enough after all those years in the catacombs to cope. But uh, I'm glad you made it. <laughs> well, you also, you know, you um, told me some, some stories, which you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that the San Francisco Chronicle used to have book reviews on the front page of the paper. Uh, know, I, I, the um, I wouldn't rule it out. I mean, on the I, I've seen old copies with Mark Twain and Jack London bylines on the cover, but by the time I got there, they were getting ready to kill the book section. And I had to covertly, without my bosses knowing it, uh, organize a rear guard action and, you know, solicit 600 letters on the slide to the editor, Phil Bronstein, until he finally said uncle. And on the front page did run in a little box uh, uh, an announcement the day the book review section was restored, uh, whose lead I will never forget. It read, okay, we blew it. Yes, yes, I remember that so clearly. That was that was just a, a, a really brilliant victory for just this common sense of, of giving people stories about books. They wanted them. Alas, a few years ago, they blew it again. And I don't know where all those 600 people went, but um, it is still gone from the Chronicles pages. Um, as are altogether too many book sections around the country. But luckily, American literature, world literature, has uh, you holding the line as best you can. Um, well, there's, a, there's lots of us. And I, I guess the reason I bring all this up is I feel that the American forms of literary arts, the novel, the, uh, the play, uh, the short story, and the poem are all um, highly dependent on their connection to what the country is, what it sounds like. And who is telling stories. And I started to discover, just because I have a bunch of old anthologies, and by old, I mean some as recent as 10 years ago, sitting around my house, as you know, David, once you're on the mailing lists of book, uh, book publishers, you never get off them, even after you die. Um, so I, I think long in, in, into my afterlife, whoever lives at my address will be receiving the, the, the fruits of the publishing industry. But back to the anthologies, I just realized that there was a, there was a, a, a massive gap between how stories were being told, uh, not just in literary culture, but in the country and what was reflected in these anthologies. Um, most of those anthologies, you know, sadly are, were mostly white or mostly men, um, or mostly uh, literary fiction. Um, and it just seemed like a, a, a high time to kind of step back and say, well, what are the best stories? And what if when we did that, um, instead of 
yoking in the decade that to some degree creates some of these problems, the 1960s, uh, where there were some amazing short story writers who were not white men, um, uh, but uh, like James Baldwin, um, there still needs to be uh, an update. And as a result, uh, you know, you can't just say that was a great decade with Mary McCarthy and John Cheever and John Updike and, you know, the, the, the last of Philip Roth stories and et cetera. Because once you look at, once you begin in the 70s, uh, it's very clear that, um, you know, being expansive and being inclusive will bring you the best. It, 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 you know, the science fiction was taking off, uh, Californian literature um, was taking off in a big way. Uh, and, you know, I, I think there was also just a, a frustration with some of the mythologies of America, which could only be prepared in telling stories about that. I'm glad you brought up California. Big surprise, I'm sure. Um, I we are both Californians, and, um, and just and you are, I believe, still the editor uh, of the Alta California Book Club. Or um, tell me a little bit about your your California bloodstock and um, how it uh, conditions the work you do, and what kind of shape we're in from a literary standpoint out here. I'll work backwards. I think California is in amazing literary shape. Um, so many of the best writers in America right now are living in are from California, you know, and, and you can cut across all genres from the essay to the poem to the novel. And in that you will find uh, just a Californian everywhere. Um, you know, whether it's Jeff Dyer's hilarious essays or Rebecca Solnit's, um, you know, writing against and through the environment, her feminist essays. Uh, whether it's Maggie Nelson's writing about gender, whether it's Claudia Rankine writing about race that was done in Southern California, whether it's a short story, you got Dana Johnson um, down in LA, um, you've got Percival Everett also in LA, um, you've got amazing novelists uh, all across the state, you've got crime fiction that was updated and made um, new, you know, with writers uh, like Walter Mosley uh, in the early 90s. It's just a uh, the last two to three decades have been an incredible flowering. Um, and part of that is, I think, recognizing um, just the variety of life as it's lived in the state. Um, also, the proximity to and constant engagement with landscape, which, which you cannot avoid in California uh, for all kinds of reasons. My family came there um, in, in the 1800s. Uh, I'm a fifth generation Californian. Um, my grandfather was in Ronald Reagan's cabinet when he was governor as a state comptroller. Um, my dad grew up in Sacramento, went to Sac High. I was born in uh, Ohio and grew up in Pennsylvania, but I moved back to Sacramento as a kid and went to high school there, graduated there. Um, and before my grandfather, who was born in um, San Francisco shortly after the earthquake and the fire, um, his father, uh, uh, was an insurance salesman who lost pretty much everything. Um, and the family lived in, uh, in San Francisco in, um, God, what's the neighborhood? Um, uh, mm, uh, I'm forgetting the street, Guerrero. They lived on Guerrero Street. Yeah. Um, uh, but, and so but my, my grandfather was born very poor and went to Berkeley and during the depression and worked his way through it. Uh, so his grandfather um, didn't really, he died impoverished. And um, his grandfather's father uh, was a baker in Grass Valley, um, which we know from census records. And, um, he'd come to uh, California after nearly starving to death in um, Canada um, after marrying his brother's, um, his, his brother's widow. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a, basically a, a westward migration story that to some degree reminds me a little bit of Joan Didion's book, Where I Was From. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when I see California as a state of people not born there, I think my family wasn't born there. I mean, if you go back far enough, um, and I think it's a state that was enriched by its, its uh, my, uh, migratory past. And, you know, the people in the state who have skin color like mine are really wise to remember how recent, <laughs> recent their, their past is, you know? Um, 
Did you grow up with books around the house uh, and readers? I mean, if you have, if you didn't, you're making up for lost time back there. But um, was it uh, was it a readerly household, or what turned you on to books? Well, I didn't have a room that looked like the room that you're in right now, or um, yours, or, or mine. Yeah, um, uh, there was a shelf in the living room and a shelf in in my mom's bedroom. And my mom was a reader. She'd been a politics major at university, and both she and my father had. Um, master's degrees, but they're in social work, not in, in literature. Uh, my dad read the Sacramento Bee every day, cover to cover, uh, in an almost uh, Talmudic way. You know, at a certain point in his midlife, he began with the obituaries, a move that I am beginning to understand. Um, you know, um, and then the sports, and then politics. Uh, so I, I grew up with newspaper readers and and book club type readers. My mother, um, you know, loved Ann Tyler. Toni Morrison, um, John Updike, you know, popular literary writers. Uh, and I think the only slight, um, uh, and, and even then it wasn't um, considered a, a literary, was that she read a lot of the Russians. Oh. You know? So during her um, gulag of, of pregnancies, you know, where my brothers and I were all born within three years of each other, she read the Gulag Archipelago. Mm -hmm. um, and there was Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and, Turgenev and um, lots of those um, writers on, on the shelf, but I didn't. I didn't pick them up. I I, I basically went and found my own stuff by going to City Lights. <laughs> <laughs> what was um, was there a, a gateway drug to literature for you? And I asked that with an ulterior motive, which is Libros is in Boyle Heights. We see a lot of young people in the door who haven't quite made up their minds whether books are going to be it for them. Um, yeah. Are there books that you press on teenagers or, or, or you know, pre-teenagers that you think can, you know, light the spark? You know, for me, it was poetry. Oh. Um, you know, I, my, my, my mother gave me an anthology in my teens called Six American Poets that had William Carlos Williams and five others in it. And I was just, be I was just reading Dylan Thomas, who had also give been given to me by my grandmother. Um, and it was at the age where, you know, music was everything. Hmm. And so something close, closer to music really made a difference. And around that exact same time, I also went to City Lights for the first time and, and picked up Allen Ginsberg. Um, and that, you know, changed my life in, in many ways. And I, I would give um, any young person uh, poetry right now. And... Right now, we're living through a golden age of American poetry. Uh, uh, I think, you know, with everyone from lots of Californians too, Kay Ryan, uh -huh. Robin Lewis, you know, the late Wanda Coleman, I would give her to anybody. Um, you know, humor, love, sens sensuality. Uh, sometime Californian resident Lucille Clifton, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a great gateway jug. For some, Adrian Rich, you know, depending on how serious they are, um, you know, uh, also, Mary Oliver is a great gateway drug. Yeah, you know, it, it doesn't have to be mists and uh, castles in, in the air or Kublai Khan like thing. I think, I think that what, one beautiful thing about poetry is there's so many different sounds to it, and they're all correct. You know, and you can have a, a world of poetry in which, um, you know, Kay Ryan has those little bullet shaped poems that seem rivetless and endless, and then you can have the sort of sprawling, you know over muchness of, of someone like C.K. Williams or, you know, I don't know, Ben Lerner today, or, you know, uh, to some degree, Sharon Olds, um, sort of prosy rhythms. So did you have to cut back on your poetry intake while you were putting together an anthology of short stories? How do you? No, actually, it helped me. It really, re it really, really helped me because um, I think the best uh, short stories are meant to be read aloud. Mm. You know, um, I, 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 I truly believe that there's a, a closer connection to orality in our short stories. You know, the novel, I think, gets to the point where it needs to sound like it's spoken. Um, but a, a short story, I do think, should be almost spoken into your ear, even if it's told in the third person. Uh, and so reading poetry while reading the stories that, that um, I was reading from to select for this book made me realize that... Uh, that music is everything, you know, and getting that seduction, that enchanting um, feeling that, uh, that, that you're being pulled into something is so key in a short story. And it has to happen very fast. 
and you know expediency is everything like there is <laughs> there are no prologues in the short story <laughs> <laughs> there's no saggy middle bit you know if that happens it's dead and we forgive that of novels because of their ambition and size and scope and everything so did you you know go to audible and look for audiobooks of all the short story writers you were considering or did you i read them to yourself yeah i mean it sounds really strange um i read them to myself i read them to friends i read them to my partner um, but first i read them uh, uh, you know in my head you know the way you normally read you know or most of us read just reading on the page and hearing you know my voice merge with the author's voice and if at that point when i put the story down i i was moved or whatever i put it into a a series of piles you know the holy cow this is an absolute yes the um, i can't imagine that this, this will not be yes the um this is very likely um this is a contender this is really good i should i should think about this twice and um i should think about this twice before letting it go it was about five or six it was like a sandwich bar of, and i put them on little post-it notes and you know over about a year and a half or two years, I read easily a thousand stories, a couple a day. Uh, and it's, it was so much fun because what I was just saying about the poetry as a kind of starter drug, I do think you can get it from a good short story, uh, but it has to be absolutely ruthlessly lean, you know, uh, and it has to have a kind of um, uh, absolute integrity about what it is. You know, that's just like it's been put through a forge. Uh, and, and I think that you get that in the best short stories. Like Tony K. Bambara's The Lesson, you know, you, re you start reading that story and it is being, it is like being spoken to uh, by someone who knows their mind, who knows exactly what's been um, kind of parlayed at them on this field trip to a toy store in New York by a teacher who wants to basically instruct them about how they're to behave, but also the hierarchies of life you know, where you belong in a class system. And this narrator, this this girl is just not having it, you know, and, and it's it says so much about, uh, you know, the, the ways that people being taught lessons often know the object of the lesson way before the person imparting the lesson does. And they know exactly what the lesson behind the lesson is. And, you know, you read that story now, and um, I think everyone, uh, but it, you know, particularly students who have grown up um, with uh, their, or anyone who's grown up with the ceiling of the world pressed down upon them. Don't think too much. Don't, don't, don't worry. Don't worry too much. Don't, don't get ahead of yourself. Don't imagine too much. This is where you belong. These are your stakes. This is how you're supposed to behave. Um, stay in your lane, <laughs> if you will. And I think that's almost everybody. You know, truly. And and. Uh, that's why that story, uh, you know, putting this book together was quite fascinating. That author had their own permissions person at Penguin Random House. You know, George Saunders, uh, you know, all the other really brilliant writers who were in this collection who were published by Penguin Random House and other divisions of that um, uh, corporation. They were handled by a group of people, but Tony Cade Bambara had one person. <laughs> Why is that? I, I had to assume, but I didn't get this confirmed that 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 her work was requested so much. Really, more than yeah. oh my God. I, you know, I, I, I there, you you as a baseball fan, you know, as a as as a sort of you know follower to some degree of the sweet science, like numbers and numerology of of greatness matters. And yet, with things like literature, it's like how do you measure how many people read a story like that? Uh, and I was recently, when I was just in my last days at LitHub, one of the editors put together a, a listicle of the best, you know, the most widely read stories of the last mm. uh, whatever years. And I said, hey, I know, <laughs> I have some answers to this because I've been working on this. And I, I had to make a case for the Bambara. Really? I said, that story has been anthologized. And it, had, and it was in a number of other anthologies um, endlessly. And, I, you know, if you talk to any teacher, they all know it. Hmm. you know was it deliberate to start out with her i mean you know i i am a baseball guy i'm a stat head you've set out this these parameters from 1970 to 2020 and yet you start with her story from 1972 with yeah. 
Were they off seasons in 70 and 71 or why did you? Yeah, they were on strike that year. There was the rebuilding a, years. <laughs> no, I, you know, and originally what I want, really wanted to do, I thought this would be so pure and nifty if every year had a story. Yeah. And I then thought... I got to a year like 1999 where I had seven contend, seven hard contenders, you know, and, uh, you know, so I, I, I basically tried my best to keep them in proportionate realms, mm -hmm. you know, so that this, there weren't 20 stories from the 70s, five from the 80s, three from the 90s, and whatever. Um, and so I think her story was actually the, chronologically the first. It was right on the edge with um, Le Guin. Yeah. Um, and Le Guin's story is brilliant for so many reasons, but it's also a great story about storytelling. Mm -hmm. and it's about stories that societies tell themselves. The, 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 the ones who walk away from Amala's and, you know, in the story, she sort of steps back as she's building this world to say, would you believe in this world more if I told you this? And it progresses to this point where suddenly she tells you this sort of awful story within the story about, you know, something that happens to someone so that the rest of the world in the story that she's building for you can continue to exist in turn. And, you know, there are all kinds of parables you can draw out of that about, you know, people who are in prison, people who are punished, labor that's not seen, people whose lives don't count or don't matter in the official narrative of the country. But she does this all in this kind of casually interrogative, but quite precise mode. And I thought if we began there, it would, it would set the tone that somehow every story had to rewrite uh, the kind of entirety of the fabric of a culture in order to be successful. Which, you know, some of them, I really think make a stab at that, but like Ted Chang's stories often, often do that from a species level. But I thought the Bambara just, you, you, you enter and you're right into it. And I thought, let's just start there. Now I noticed in the, uh, in the author bios in back, there's only one where you actually editorialize and it's Le Guin, was that consciousness, conscious? Um, I do think Le Guin is, is, is uh, underestimated as a writer. Um, Not in California, pal. Yeah, no, I believe, believe me, I mean, you know, I, I am, I didn't go to Berkeley, my dad and grandfather did, and to, to know that Berkeley High created two of the best uh, writers in the 20th century, Philip K. Dick and Le Guin. Thank you. Uh, you know, together, just, and it, I not interviewed- in, not, in the, not in the same cafeteria at the same time, I don't, or, or correct me. No, she, she, she knew who he was oh. and said he was a little bit of the invisible man. I think he was three years behind or ahead of her, one of the two. And I, I interviewed her in the last two years of her life when I forget which, maybe the small beer collection was the most recent of, yeah. of her collected stories. She was incredible, a great talker, knew her mind, was funny, sort of um, really didn't suffer fools. <laughs> so as an interview, that was a, a fun one to prepare for. But you know, as, as in putting those bios together, um, uh, you know, I, I, I think Le Guin is, is often, I think because it's genre, literary, the literary world, the teaching world, often kind of gently pets the heads of those who read it or the people who are teaching it. Like, yeah, you'll, you'll teach this stuff to get people to, to read as if, okay, reading's good for you. We put some Velveeta cheese on it. Um, but when you're serious, you know, talk to me and then I'll give you a, I don't know, John Updike story. And, and that's just not the case. Like enchantment can exist in equal measure with uh, challenges and disruptions you know, to you that are significant to how you behave as a citizen. And Le Guin to me is one of the perfect examples of that. Um, how about the end of the book? I mean, since we're talking about structure and your, your sadly abandoned, uh, you know, gematria complicated schemes of, of, uh, <laughs> of, of time, um, you ended with the Manuel Munoz story. Um, I love that story. Uh, what's it? Is that a, well, uh, how did you decide to end with that one? That that was the note you wanted to bookend back to, to Tony K. Bambara with or, or leave the reader with? Well, I mean, there's a couple answers to this question. One is that um, it was the last story uh, in terms of uh, years. You know, I was looking in, in the, in, because this book um, was finished at the end, you know, literally in terms of the stories being chosen in, in 2020, um, 
I was looking at stories published in 2020, but I couldn't look much further than the early part of the year. Um, and I didn't find anything published in the early part of 2020 that stood up to all the other stories that had been included. Uh, and the, the second part is, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an important thing, I think, to remember in, in our American life that everything is a lottery. No one, none of us chose to be born, you know, uh, in LA versus, you know, Cleveland for me, you know, and, and the accidents of our birth determine quite a bit. Um, and I think there's simultaneously within the um, sometimes unstudied acceptance of those, that lottery system uh, and uh, a, a corrective sense that, okay, those who've been born um, with, a, with a much worse lottery number somehow have different um, emotional systems or somehow they have different concerns. And out of these um, corrective distortionary myths, I think we end up with things, um, you know, like the, the noble savage, as it was once called. And we, and we tell these stories to us to help assuage the, the bigger story, which is that we are in the lottery, you know, wh and what are we gonna do about that? Uh, and to me, one of the great stories right now of American life is just how many people are, um, are living uh, in day-to-day -day poverty and are mo taking enormous risks to try to get out of it. Um, and to some, it's people that come into the country, to some it's people who move, um, who start new jobs. And this is a story that's somehow about all those things, you know, and about a woman who's kind of staked her future on, you know, making this kind of move to another part of the country with a kind of, with a car that she's maybe not really asked for. And in the course of the story, all these things fall apart for her. Uh, and the way that the woman behaves and the way that people around her behave is so much different than um, many stories I've read in which uh, tragedy is, is, is seen as an, as an unexpected thing. That loss is seen as a kind of blow from, from you know, it's like getting T-boned in an intersection. Um, and everyone in this story behaves like, as if, okay, that's just happened. Uh, and yes. here, here's another blow and that's just happened. But let's not, um, you know, get ahead of ourselves and try to work our way out of it. And let's try not to judge the people who have participated in this system of, of um, taking it and, and, and giving. Uh, and I'm, I'm trying to not give away the story. So forgive me for the op opacity of what I'm saying, but essentially what, what emerges is no villains. Yeah. Even though someone has, has basically stolen something from her that she desperately needed. Um, and that, that to me is a, is a profound insight into the world in which um, uh, these characters are living and simultaneously uh, into the, the, the way that we might want to see the world a little bit, um, at least on the people level, not the institution level, if we're ever going to um, treat most Americans with, with all Americans, sorry, with, with equality. It's an amazing story, and I really owe you for including it, because shamefully, I hadn't known it before. I mean, you know, there are times with my students, I wish I could, you know, assign them the grapes of wrath for one class, and that's obviously not feasible. And this is this is a story that I think is is every bit the equal of that. It's. I'm so glad you made that comparison because I I at some point that just sort of leapt into my mind, you know, uh, um, while I was reading because it's part of a series of stories he's he's published in the recent years, and so um, there are other stories of his I could choose from. One of which I published in, in 2019 as well. Um, and he's got a book coming out with Grey Wolf um, and stories of short stories. Yeah. And, and, uh, you know, I grew up reading Grapes of Wrath and Grapes of Wrath sensitized me to, uh, um, to some of the ways that life was lived in the Western uh, migration that um, uh, added population to the states of like California 
you know, and what people um, who were living uh, hand to mouth off the land, off a land that it was itself in the middle of a kind of climate crisis as a result of that migration yeah. and some of those farming methods, how that life was lived. And, but it needs to be updated because, you know, uh, I, you know, I don't think it, I don't participate in the um, John Steinbeck uh, should have done this and should have done that. I think John Steinbeck was working within the limits of his capacity and those were, that was an immense capacity. Yeah. But we now have a different crisis. Uh, and that's one of, um, of documentation and migration and treating all people who are residing in a place equally, which seems especially acute given, you know, how many people are working um, undocumented jobs uh, for very little money, which are essentially frontline essential labor, and yet are somehow being demonized at, this, at, this, at, the, at the same time. And all I can say about Manuel Munoz's stories is it, 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 they all exist in that world and it's not seen from a distance. It's seen from the perspective of someone who grew up the son of someone who worked in the um, you know, central Californian uh, onion fields you know, as, a, as a migrant laborer himself. And that to me makes a difference. For the record, it's an amazing story. It's called Anyone Can Do It by Manuel Munoz. Um, did you have either while you were preparing this anthology um, the experience of communicating or knowing some of these authors or being lobbied by some of these authors or did you have the experience after including them of, of getting to break the news as if they I mean it's fair to say it's it's winning a kind of prize how does how did this um, you know, enrich or deepen or distort or create friendships with uh, any of the authors, most of whom I guess it's fair to say are alive by no means all. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't lobbied, I can tell you that, but I, I did at some point start, um, you know, I, as, as you know, um, even when you spend your entire life in books, it's, uh, you, there, you still know far less than you think you do. Hmm. And what there the are lots of other people. <laughs> well, I, 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 I think probably in your time at the Chronicle and elsewhere interviewing people, you suddenly realize that you can, you can spend your entire life reading and still miss lots of great work. And uh, so I started writing to people whom I thought I could ask to. And so those people lobbied uh, to some degree saying, oh, you really should include this. You should think about this. Um, you know, people that didn't really write short stories, but maybe taught them, yeah. um, were especially helpful. Uh, you know, one of the Singer stories, for example, The Reencounter, came as a result of a series of failures to find um, a story uh, that, that someone had sent me to, and I thought, the story isn't working for me. And then I stumbled upon The Reencounter in a Peter Straub book of oh. stories of the fantastic, you know, for the Library of America. And so sometimes, someone else's anthology work helped me. But I didn't actually have that much contact with the authors themselves. Like Manuel Munoz is someone I'd published before, but I've never met him in person or spoken on the phone. And I, my primary contact with him has been through his agent, um, this guy, Stuart Bernstein, who works with Sandra Cisneros, yeah. uh, Julia Alvarez, um, and a, a lot of the writers from the sort of uh, Latinx boom of the, of the of the 70s, 80s, and 90s, but who obviously is carrying that sort of tradition forward. And so I had more, much more contact with um, agents, but I didn't tell agents I was putting this together. Um, I really just uh, tried to keep it as, as pure to uh, hear a short story fanatics, you know? And I, I, sometimes I felt like there was some sort of failure from, on my behalf not to try because I really read a lot, um, but why, why, why didn't I fall in love with Donald Bartholomew? You know, mm -hmm. I read I read about a hundred stories by Bartholomew. You know, I read the, all the stories that that ever, that have been anthologized. That everyone said you really have to read this. Stephen Milhauser, same thing. You know, I, I read um, I must have read all of his New and Selected. Um, and then there were sto short story writers that had previously been just treasured by me, that the writers that I thought, when I put together the proposal for this book, I'm definitely gonna put them in, um, such as uh, Annie Prue and Laurie Moore. 
And then I went and read their stories and I thought, was, let me let me try that again. And you know, I uh, was with with Prue. I was I was especially struck because of her her work in that first Wyoming Stories volume. I, I I always thought, and I still think, is very strong. But something about reading it, uh, it 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 just caromed off the the burner, you know. Um, and the same with Moore, where I I think she's a fantastic short story writer. I think her impact has been. Um, immense, you know, without more, you don't have the kind of um, tornadoes of hilarity and, and kind of internal anxiety that you get in, um, in Lauren Groff, you know. Um, but I, I read more over and over and, and I, I, would, I would, except for one or two stories, I would forget which story I read the previous day. Hmm. Uh, and I, which is not to say that she's not a great short story writer, it was just that and this round going through, you know, and trying them over and over again, I just, I just struck out. And so I really had to stay with the stories that, that were, um, that were doing the, that were basically creating the effects over and over again, you know, no matter how many times, like Dorothy Allison, I, I never thought of her as a short story writer. And um, Lisa Lucas who's now my colleague at um, Pantheon when she was at the National Book Foundation and a job similar to the one you used to do for the, for the government, um, sort of stumping for literature. Yeah. I, uh, she put up a post saying, what are your favorite short story writers? Um, and she, uh, she got uh, hundreds of responses, mm. you know, and, and not just names, but titles, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I read all of the, every single story that was, you know, mentioned in that, that thread, because I thought, you know, these are people who are just waiting <laughs> to, to get the opportunity to recommend a short story. Like that's exactly who I want to listen to. Plus I'm never going to meet, meet these 336 people or whatever it was. Uh, and some, you know, obviously kept coming up over and again. Um, and some of them like uh, Charles Johnson's China, yeah. you know, it was recommended a few times and um, Jason Reynolds, uh, the, uh, the Y um, novelist, who's I think just absolutely brilliant and a force uh, of so many talents. Uh, he, he, when, when that title came up on Twitter, he, he said, oh my God, yeah. He said something and I thought, all right, this is, um, this is not how I would do the whole thing, but having this kind of impact, uh, this kind of, you know, almost a public space debate, um, I found immensely helpful because it, it took me out of, only talking to people I know, you know? Well, the debate is probably only beginning. I mean, that's what happens when you edit an anthology. All of a sudden, it's anybody's pigeon and you're gonna be second guessed for any number of reasons. Um, how do you, how comfortable are you? Have you been with the idea of anointing, uh, you know, some stories and leaving others out? How ready are you for you know, the, uh, the, the fusillades that may come your way. Um, how comfortable are you with this? I'm pretty comfortable in the sense that um, I know I've read the stories, you mm -hmm. know. So if someone says, why don't you have ZZ Packer's brownies in there? And again, I love ZZ Packer's collection. I think that's a, that's a really strong short story. But I have 35 stories in this book, you know. And I, the question I asked myself at every point, and this was the last stage, was, Okay, which one am I going to take out? Yeah, because they didn't want to book more than five hundred pages. You know, otherwise, I, I could have easily made a thousand-page book and included everything. You know, that 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 was it, it was in the realm. But to get to this, I really had to to make some choices. Um, and that story's been anthologized a lot, uh, and I think it's very strong. But I, I thought, um, you know, there's there's a writer like Andrew Holleran. Um, and it's not ZZ Packer versus Andrew Holleran, but there's a long story in, in here by, by him. Um, you know, he was, he wrote one, the best-selling, uh, you know, pre-AIDS novel of gay life in, a, in America um, of all time, uh, The Dancer from the Dance. And, and then over 50 years wrote these amazing, uh, lyrical, quite funny, um, and very sad short stories that um, um, around the 80s um, started to chronicle and engage with the, 
what was happening with the, the AIDS crisis. And I thought, this is a, this is a great story. You know, it's going to, it's going to cost me some because it's, it's over 10,000 words. Um, but it's a, it's a piece of the short story history. It's a piece of American life um, that only he could tell. And that that's exquisitely done. Um, and so I, I, you know, with, with the one or two of the longer stories, the Sontag was another one um, where I thought I, I can't justify dropping the story. It's just that good. So yeah, I'm ready for the debate. I mean, as for, you asked me about people I know, and there are some people in the book that I know, like my, I'm Alexander Hemon, you know, uh, has a story, the conductor. Um, but I, I, I knew um, Hemon's work before I knew him. Uh, and I reviewed it several times before I met him, maybe even for the Chronicle. Um, and it's only grown with time for me. Um, I've read and reread those that his collection, the one in particular, Love, Love and Obstacles, in which the conductor appears. There were several, like uh, as with Carver, there was there were several stories by him, and I could have included, you know, as with Bambara too, to be honest. Um, and so I, I you know. I think at a certain point as a as a professional in literature, you you will reach a point where you have to uh, essentially distort your taste in order to to correct for the appearance of of a possible conflict of interest. Mm. Uh, and I decided not to do that, to be honest. I, I thought, um, I'm not reviewing these stories, you know. Um, you know, as a reader, uh, I can't say I'm objective, um, but I also know it helps no one, particularly the people included, if I'm doing anyone a favor to put them in this book. This fee is not so high. There's no, they're not, this is not like a, a, a an easy pass to Stockholm. <laughs> Inclusion in this. It is simply an anthology um, that uh, brings together stories. And my interest was really just what are the best stories? And the, as, as you know, like from your, your days as a, as a reviewer, but also just from your life as a reader, the real thing cannot be denied. Yeah. It really can't, you know? And I, so when it came down to it, uh, there were some stories hovering around the edges, which, which I was swapping in and out until the last minute, but I, in the end, I'm, I'm really happy with how it, with what, what's turned up in there. And, um, you know, the nice thing about this that's different from editing, say, a literary magazine is once once I made the choice, it wasn't, um, okay, let's start editing this thing because they were perfect. <laughs> you know, there was nothing wrong with them, you know, uh, <laughs> as short stories. There's no editing needed at all. And and so that in that sense, it felt um, because of the cycles of reading them and, and then reading them aloud, I, I felt really sure once I was done with it. Um, well, I guess if there's a silver lining these days, there won't be any cocktail parties anytime soon for people to throw a drink in your face. If you could apologize to one writer you left out, or if there was one story, the story you cut last, what was that? Oh God, that's such a hard question. Um, you know, there, I would, I would, I would sort of, I, I, I would answer the question, um, you know, if I had an extra hundred pages, <laughs> yeah. you know, the, the stories I, I would have included would have would have been Packers, uh, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, probably a, a story from Amy Tam. Oh, um, you know, from the Joy Luck Club. This I forget the story's name, but it's about a a child chess prodigy. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I God, I love that story. But you know. It's also, it's been anthologized a billion times and, and you know, Amy Tan, um, well, she's not really a short story writer. Anyway, I made my yeah. uh, accommodations for that one. Um, it, so yeah, it was Tan, Packer, uh, and um, Deborah Eisenberg. Oh. Um, I, oh. I love her work so much. It's given me so much pleasure. Uh, and I, I reread her collected stories and, and then the, some of the more recent ones and, um, I still, as much as I love, um, you know, the stories that came out around 9-11, um, I forget the title right now, but uh, I always go back to her first collection, 
Mm -hmm. Eisenberg. Um, tell me, I think, I think there's a title, like, what was it like for Chris? Um, uh, and then there was another one. Um, and they're all, you know, stories about um, kind of trying to remake your moral universe as a young person. Mm. And, you know, in, in, in the way the stories are told, you think they're about living in New York, they're about single, they're not. They're about something much bigger, actually. And, and the way that she writes them is, is, was, had so much energy and verb. Um, they were just, once I had made, decided I was really gonna include, um, you know, two thirds of it, it was just too long. Yeah, and, and so I, 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 one thing I thought about doing after this was, um, you know, making a, uh, or proposing a, a book of the long short story or the novella, mm. because, you know, there there were so many stories floating around that are really novellas. Kelly Link is a master of them. I think her best work is always in that at that length. Um, an another person who who um, did them very well is, is frankly, is Prue. I th I feel like some of her stories were novellas disguised as short stories, you know, with, with, with font size. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Brokeback Mountain is, is I think, is, I, I read as a novella. Um, Anthony Doerr, you know, he's really good at that. Um, uh, and then Dan there are these other, and then there are these other ones you, you made room for, which are just in and out, which just, um, you know, eviscerate you in a split second and a page later they're gone. The Sandra Cisneros story, the, mm -hmm. the, um, the George Sanders, Saunders story. Um, no, it's a, it's a gorgeous uh, anthology. Congratulations. Um, and good to hear you mention Amy Tan. I'm trying to get her to reform the rock bottom remainders so that they can, <laughs> I want them to play a benefit for the reinvention of the Federal Writers Project. I'll, I'll chew your ear off one of these days about my, my wow. aid to restart the FWP. Well, I think, I think it's, it's time. I mean, I, I think we've come through this explosion of corruption and narcissism and, uh, and Ayn Randianism. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's, it, it's collapsed. Uh, it's, it, it, the, the hyper individualism um, has been proven to be highly destructive to our society. And we've reached the limit of what people I think would tolerate uh, in terms of a life without the, the notions of the collective. It's, it's at the root of actually everything that um, our country needs to start addressing on a policy level. You know, community policing and fixing the relationship between police forces and and cities and, and towns is entirely based on collective in, in enterprise. Um, you know, on lots of people being involved in it. Voting you know, is a is a highly collective enterprise, and you can't get a free will of the country by simply <laughs> subtracting them. You know, even corporations are standing up uh, against that right now. And um, you know, those these. The, 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 the COVID-19 measures that were passed, the stimulus bill, and now the um, infrastructure package that, that the Biden administration wants to pass, they're all being predicated on an idea of collective enterprise and um, sharing of wealth. And of course, you know, you remember um, from your own history uh, is, as, a, as a reader and as a Californian, and how important the, the WPA was to um, sh sharing the wealth and also keeping people afloat. Yeah. And yeah. making careers where there were no careers before. I mean, yeah. the, uh, the stat that I trot out and feel free to, you know, call this um, arbitrary or skewed is that um, for the first 40 years of, you mentioned Stockholm, the first 40 years of the Nobel Prize, Americans won one. Yeah. Uh, and for the 80 years uh, since the Federal Writers Project, um, they did not win two, they won 12, uh, which is more than any other country. Um, and even though only one of them, Saul Bellow, was a Nobel laureate, you know, it's impossible to think of Svetlana Alexievich without Saul Bellow, without Studs Terkel, who came out of the project. You can't think about Toni Morrison without looking at, um, you know, Hurston and Ellison and Richard Wright, all of whom, but I mean, you know, we interrupt this interview for a stump speech from David Kippen. No, just uh, watch this space. I don't think it's, I don't think it's, um, 
you know, I don't think it's off topic is the thing, you know, there has been for so many years in small and sometimes wide circles, this notion that you can um, participate in and, and be part of literary culture, but be apolitical. I just think it's totally bogus. You know, it's not that literature has to stump for certain values or that it has to be used politically. Um, but if you think literature is unconnected to power and fairness and justice, and that it's not watching what happens in the world, and that it's not made by people who have those feelings and think about those things, you're in a fantasy land, you know? And it, it, the magical thinking in order to perpetuate that, um, that, that idea of literature is, could be so vastly better spent, um, you know, creating spaces like the WPA for um, writers who have things to say, who need support um, to go to work uh, and to do things that can be shared publicly. So I'm, I'm, I don't think it's at all unrelated to something like uh, an anthology like this. Because all these writers to me, and I think it's different from say, if this was a you know, German an anthology of short stories, you know, they don't have the same tradition we do, but I don't think they don't, I don't think they, I don't think they do have the tradition because they don't have the same tradition of witnessing their culture in the same way, hmm. you know? And that, and that relates to things like WPA and, you know, the publications which emerge out of that period, some of them communists, you know, sure. um, and then some of them very extremely capitalists and, you know, driven by ads. But I, I think that that aspect of watchfulness is deeply ingrained and it's ingrained in the story too. It's it's so provocative to to talk with you um, about this. I mean, yeah. I mean, you. I think of you as such an internationalist. I mean, the last time I saw you, you were here back in California editing a, a, an issue of Granta around uh, Spanish language literature and translation. Um, so uh, so I, I'm, I'm I'm America should be thrilled that you've turned your attention to the last 50 years in, in this country's short stories. I'm sure you're, you're perfectly, you're, you're more than knowledgeable enough to have edited the, the Penguin book of the, the world short story. Well, do you, do you, did you ever go through phases as a reader, you know, where you, you, you look back on what you've read even before you've reread it and you think, I wonder how this is, I, I, already this is changing just as cognitively our ideas of ourself change and therefore the stories and our memories even change to fit the stories we tell ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that's so um, exciting and, and mutable about literature is just as the story of the country changes, it, um, more li literature, literature is more accessible to us because hopefully we're, we're, get, we're grabbing more of it, you know? Uh, and I think this idea that somehow, you know, being um, more inclusive about literature, whether it's genre or who writes it, you know, what, what their gender is or race or ethnicity, that it's somehow some special interest is, to me, it seems really bogus because it, the, the stories by and large, um, the work by and large has always been written, you know, um, but we have to keep cycling back uh, through our time to figure out what they were telling us all along. And that, that to me is, is one of the excitements about um, a project like this is like, what, what were these stories telling us in 1972 and three and four, you know? And I, I especially am glad that you mentioned the flash fiction because mm -hmm. um, that was thought to be a, a kind of 90s or even aughts kind of invention that, you know, the sort of in out quick thing glancing. And, and then you see, you know, Alice Walker's um, story, uh, I think it's the flowers or flowers, which is, you know, that's a few hundred words and it's just devastating. You know, that's from the late seventies. Um, well, yeah, I, I just, I mean, I, I, I should, I, I glance at the book, I see the jacket and you're a book editor now, right? And you've always been an editor. Um, yeah. I, I meant to ask you about the cover art. I mean, this must have been, you know, masochistic to think about what possible image you could put on the cover of a book that is so much bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. How did you go about that? The, I have to say that um, I, I edited a series of anthologies with Penguin um, about inequality, one about New York, one about America, one about 
the um, global climate crisis and how it's affecting different places at different rates and the stories people tell to accommodate um, that inequality or to engage with it, you know, or what stories people tell in places um, that are outside of the cone of American ideas of the climate crisis. And for each one of those books, they made amazing covers. Uh, so when they were close to doing um, this cover, I, I didn't give them any advice. I just said, you know, it just should be dramatic because I think the, the American short story is dramatic. <laughs> you know, it's, it's um, and, and that's not the reputation it has. That it, it weirdly, you, you, you probably remember all these debates about the New Yorker short story or the yeah. MFA short story, the boring, you know, backs into it, you know, suburban malaise story. Those stories are far less common than you think when you actually read widely amongst the short story. Yeah. Uh, there's uh, American short story has such variety, but one thing I do feel from it is is drama and a little bit of menace. Not not always danger or th or threat. Um, and so, and, and landscape is a big theme of it. You know, with people like Rick Bass and others. So when they came up with this image of this uh, tornado, um, kind of ominously, but also slightly beautifully yeah. come, looming on the horizon, I just thought that's the American sublime right there, you know, <laughs> come destroy me, but let me take a video of you while you're doing it. We can upload it onto YouTube. <laughs> uh, well, it's lovely. I mean, that's what happens with a jacket. I know from, uh, from dear Los Angeles, you know, it, it's somebody else's, but eventually it becomes the emblem in your head of, of what you've done. Um, and you've done so much here. I should ask you, um, you have, just taken on new responsibilities because of course you know you were such a, a slug abed before talk <laughs> talk a little bit about your hopes for tell people what you're doing next and your hopes for it well i was always um i was always cheered by uh people that were in the field of literary criticism ahead of me because i, I at some point i realized i, I wasn't going to review books for my entire life you know, I would probably do it in some form or other, but to do it on a daily level, to be that daily reviewer for your whole life, that is a, that is a one in 10 million skill, you know, maybe more, um, because it's not just about engagement and curiosity. It's about durability. It's about variety of phrasing. You know, it's about finding ways person. to stay compelling. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, so to go back to your room, the book cave at the Chronicle, you know, both you and Oscar have had many hats since I've known you. You know, you were briefly in Washington um, leading the, the, the campaign for the big read. You know, you've come out to um, back to LA and um, open up Libros Migros, and now you're doing this podcast. And, uh, you know, I, at some point I realized that the greater freedom that you had as a, as a participant in literary culture might come from uh, connectivity and being involved in collaborative projects. And as much as I love writing, um, I'm not constitutionally s situated to just write, you know? And so uh, making anthologies, you know, like, as you did with Dear Los Angeles, to me, that feels like a, it's a really rewarding process. Uh, you know, this was choosing and including, but it was still hundreds of people were involved in this book in permissions, editors, publishing houses, lawyers, did anybody you know, not give you permission? I'm curious. Yes, yes, really? one person. Um, Tony Morrison's estate, ah. you know. <laughs> and I read that story. It was in an anthology that Amiri Baraka and, and his wife put together of black writing. And she has this story, Recitalif, which- um, Say it again. I, uh, Recitalif, uh, or recite, R-E-C-A-T-L, recite. Is it recitative like an opera? Maybe. Um, Anyway, it's a story published that she wrote in the late 70s, early 80s, around the time that she was writing um, Tar Baby. And uh, I, I just, it's, a, it's an incredible short story. It's, you know, you realize that Toni Morrison could have been, had she wanted to be Alice Munro as well. You know, and that's what's so remarkable about it. It's slightly theatrical, it's about two girls, you know, that you meet, that they're, they're going to a, um, uh, a kind of, school for orphans kind of um you don't know which one is black which one is white and then she follows them over the course of a few decades and their fates turning and twisting and sometimes one's up sometimes one's down you go through the 
kind of black arts movement and the protests of the 70s with them. And, and it's, it's a very powerful emotionally, politically. And I wrote to uh, Morrison's agent saying, you know, this is just, I, I would love to include this. And they, they said no, and, and kindly. Um, and I thought they're saying no, because this is going to be a little book, which it is. It's actually coming out next year from my new employer, <laughs> um, Knopf. A little book? What do you mean? It's going to be a little book, you know, probably 80. Oh, the, that pages. one story is going to be yeah. a, a pocketbook. Got it. Yeah. Hmm. Um, and it's, it, it, you know, when I read it, I thought that if, if, if I were this author's agent or publisher, I would make this a book. Yeah. You know? um, so that was the, that was the one, the one heartache. Um, but back to what you were asking me, the, the, I realized that variety and collaboration were key to staying engaged, you know, and, and doing things that were not about me, you know, really helps and doing something that felt like I was participating in something larger than me. Um, and you know, that, that might sound like a, a, slightly, a slightly fatuous way to talk about working for a corporation, but you know, I, I've, I've been editing Freeman's for a while, you know, I don't get paid to do it. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an unpaid job, but I love doing it because I realize it's something, it, it's a, it was a way to, 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 to keep publishing at that length. And I really love the, the, the editing and the collaboration I'm allowed to do there. But sometimes, you know, some of the pieces like Valeria Luiselli's, um, tell me how it ends, which started in Freeman's was a 12,000 word essay, Lydia Davis's piece about learning Norwegian by studying the, uh, the novel by Dag Solstad, which was considered his most difficult novel in Norwegian, relying upon the gerunds of German that she had from her childhood years of studying that language um, and translating on the fly al fresco with no dictionary, which is an essay that transcribes over 20,000 words. I thought, you know, at what point should I just start you know, carrying some of these projects over into books. And the idea when I was at Grove as a kind of editor at large attached to LitHub was that that would happen. And I did edit a few books, but I, I'm, I'm, I started to get hungry to, to have a longer engagement with projects. And so that's why when um, uh, I had resigned from my job at LitHub just to take a break from the internet, which is a, <laughs> you know, which is a, can be a thankless taskmaster of the internet. It's just needs feeding all the time. I, I, I had planned to just, you know, walk dogs and, you know, find something else to do. And then when Knopf called about this pot potential position, I saw that that here in front of me was a chance to, um, to work on behalf of books I loved, uh, over a, a period of time that would allow that love to have a really deep resonance, you know, not just for me, but hopefully tra you know, transpose that passion into the publication of the book and, and then eventually get it into the hands of readers, which, you know, I can't do much in the world. I, I couldn't trim your, you know, tree, tree tops. I, there's, there's very little I can do on a car engine, um, but I do feel like I can publish and what I, what I'm looking forward to now is just spending some time doing that with books, you know. Well, for heaven's sake, please keep time for your own work. I mean, those of us who are, love your poetry and your nonfiction and everything you do under your own byline, um, carve out the time for that. I mean, I hear what you're saying. You know, I do a million things. I fight for a new WPA. I teach. I run, run Libros, but I'm trying now. Um, with all this god awful time that we've been cursed with, um, mm -hmm. to carve out a little time for my own fiction, and no, oh, that that makes me happy to hear. You know, <laughs> well, I, I was, I feel like you know how, and I, I'm, I'm really, I hope this doesn't sound as, you know, as a writer, you, metaphors and similes pop into your head faster than your editing skills sometimes do. Typing skills, go ahead. <laughs> One of the one of my high points as an as a participatory observer to literary criticism was was the was your last year of reviewing. Um, it was like watching, you know, like 
like John Cruck hit 340, you know, for half the season. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was like this sort of this 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 um this sudden burst, you know, of 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 um of 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 late reviewing style because it it was clear to I don't know for to me from the outside I thought Dave was not going to do this forever but you're you went out swinging hard you know and I thought this is and I, it was a to me it was like it was a, it was an example of how you know in a job that requires a lot of sometimes invisible thankless grinding you know, if, if you, if you give yourself a time limit for it, you can hit another gear, you know, you couldn't pick a Dodger, but I forgive you. <laughs> That's lovely to hear. And yeah, my, my aspiration as I hope it remains yours is to be a player manager. Uh, <laughs> but I think, you know, that's what I think uh, when someone says to me, you know, like you or someone else who's always wanted to do something in literature, whether it's right, fiction or stories or a poem or poetry or you know or, or finally write this biography that they you know one of my students recently had a book out last year she was uh, 52 when it came out um she'd had her about 80 jobs before the job of writer became her job and they included everything from short order cook to you know person who helps build stone walls. <laughs> I mean, really not, not glamorous jobs. This was not someone working their way through residencies. And when her book came out, a lifetime of kind of thinking about it, kind of, it was, it was right there in the writing. It was like, this is someone who simply needed to be given the lane, you know? And sometimes you have to give yourself that lane. And I, so when someone says to me, like you do, who's had a different life and, and writing, Oh, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna write fiction now. I think, go with God. Do it. Absolutely, do it. Seriously. Well, you know, I, I I love the late blooming stories. Simply, you know, <laughs> well, I mean, Tolstoy was one of them. Annie Prue, you know, fifty when those books started coming out. We shall see. Um, Harriet Harriet, uh, Harriet Dorr, Harriet remember? Dorr, she? for heaven's sake, who yeah was was in her 70s and listening to Vin Scully, who is of course the best writing teacher anybody could ever have. Um, one last question. Um, I'm assuming you have a new job and you still haven't set foot in the office. Um, offices grow ever more irrelevant these days. Um, so why not come home to California and edit from here? <laughs> Do, are, have you been talking to my dad? Uh, Was he saying the same thing? In so many words. I mean, I I have been coming back to Sacramento and California more in the recent years. Um, not this past year because they were in lockdown and I ended up going to England with my partner um, whose mother was in lockdown and, you know, needed more assistance. My dad's, my dad's a goat. I mean, he's, <laughs> he's 82. And I once visited him and we had our step counters on us and um, he was spending the summer then living in um, Chester in England uh, because he's, since my mom died, he married and his wife is, um, uh, her father was English. Um, I think he was English. Anyway, they, they spend part of their time in England and at, after a day walking around with him, my, my step counter read 15 miles. <laughs> And we got back to the house. He said, oh, what do you want to do? I said, I'm going to take a nap. <laughs> you know, and he sat down and did some other, you know, retired guy thing. And I, I sat there and just recovered. Um, but, you know, my dad's been asking that. And I don't know. Um, partly it's to, to domestic arrangements. You know, my partner's agency is here. And it does have to kind of be here. Even though everyone can be anywhere, it still has a physical, you know, it's part, their office is partly opened. Um, whereas Knopf's is not, PRH is not. I don't think they'll be reopened until probably the fall. And even then, their attitude, or at least stated attitude, at least for someone like me, is you know you can you can work remotely part of the time. So I, I will I will be the guy like you were living in a in a trailer in Malibu, commuting up, you know. <laughs> Um, that out you, um, you know, the, I, I will, um, I, you know, I probably, I, I will spend part of the year in England because that's where part of my family is. 
Uh, and then at, at some point I do hope to do some of it from California. Uh, you know, I'm, my first book is a, is by a Californian. It's uh, Dave Eggers' uh, new book, which is um, a sequel to The Circle. Uh, oh. the first book I've edited for them. Uh, it's called The Every, which is uh, astonishingly good and necessary, a kind of 1984 of our time. And also a brilliant portrait of, um, you know, Silicon Valley and the and the venture capitalism that's been feeding it and the panopticon it's created and how it's changed our behavior. And, you know, I've, I just, I have so much faith and interest in what Californians are doing as writers and also the bookstores, you know, I've been working with them a lot more with um, the Alta Book Club, you know, and I've yeah. been in and out of more California bookstores in the last two years than probably the last 10 combined. Well, so yeah, the, the interest is there. It's just more about finding the domestic. I might have to just go on my own, you know, for months or two at a time. Well, um, for heaven's sake, uh, I'm, I'm glad you're still doing, gonna do the Alta Book Club. Um, and uh, wow. let's see, um, you, are, you are the best advocate uh, a writer uh, could possibly dream of and, um, and, and such a good writer in your own right. I, you know, the internet has a lot to answer for, um, <laughs> but if it, if it gets you out here more and it enables us to have uh, 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 more conversations like this one, and maybe it even gets you into Libros, which has gone from, you know, a fire trap to a shoebox to a show place now. I love, I, I love the progression. It's, it's really been fun to, to watch and hear. Well, by all means, come on in. I know it's probably next to impossible, but I will do my damnedest to find a good book that you've never read. So um, <laughs> thank you very much, John Freeman. And uh, awesome. say hi to Nicole. And to Hello. Thank, thank you for opening your door 22 years ago at, uh, or 23 in, in San Francisco. You know, not that many book editors would say to someone who'd been emailing them cold call style for a few months, uh, yeah, if you're in town, why don't you stop by, you know, and, and look, here we are 20, 22, 23 years later. Well, I'm so glad you took me up on the invitation then and this morning. I'll, I'll talk to you soon, John. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thanks, David. You bet. You should be a radio host, man. You, you really <laughs> We're going to cut it off right there. So ends another episode of Libro Schmibros, recorded at the bilingual nonprofit Libro Schmibros Lending Library in Boyle Heights. By all means, follow us online in all the old familiar places or email us via info at libroschmibros.org. By the way, we couldn't do this podcast without the whole Libros team, Quatemoc, Colleen, Diana, and Alberto. And all of them would kill me if I didn't add this. Please consider visiting libroschmibros.org hitting the donut button, <laughs> the donate button, and giving us a gift. We put good free books into people's hands five days a week here at Libros, right across from Mariachi Plaza, up in the old Boyle Hotel. I'm David Kippen, and there'll always be a free book for you, and thousands more to borrow here at Libros Schmibros.